Hey everyone, welcome to the Online Course Masters Show where you learn how to create, publish, and promote your very own online courses. I'm your host, Phil Ebener, and as always, I'm with Jeremy Deegan. And today we're excited to dive into another topic related to creating your online course, course extras. What can we add to our course to make it and take it to that next level where students really, really love it? So we're going to dive into that. But as always, make sure you head over to onlinecoursemasters.com to check out the show notes, to watch the video version of this episode, and to join our community. Hit that community button up at the top of the site, and you can join our own Facebook group and keep this conversation going after the episode ends. So Jeremy, how's it going? Welcome back to the show. Good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. It's another, man, cloudy. I feel like every time we record, it's kind of cloudy and rainy <laughs> here in Southern California, which is kind of good luck. We need it. So <laughs> so it's good. Good, good over here. I've been been really busy a couple months away from the, the twins getting here and been doing all of our hospital tours and getting ready, going to be taking some baby classes. And so that's pretty much all that's on my mind right now. <laughs> so, so it's good. Yeah, that's a, it's a crazy time uh, leading up to that. I just remember, oh man, all those classes and just your mind is just everywhere thinking about all the different things you got to do and the babies come in and what it's going to be like. So it's exciting, man. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is, I don't know, I think it's different for people with different health insurance, but our doctor, he goes to four different hospitals. So he said, oh yeah, go check them all out. And they all have like these tours and then they all have raffles to people just to incentivize people to come and stuff. And I never win raffles. Like my entire life, I've never won a raffle. But there's something in in the world right now. I think it's because we're having <laughs> twins that, you know, the spirits are aligning and they're like, OK, Phil and Isabel, you need a couple extra packs of diapers. You're going to win the <laughs> raffle because we've won it two out of three times we've gone to <laughs> nice. hospital tours. So it's it, we're thinking about, you know, just doing some hospital hospital tour crashing, even if we're not pregnant. So. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you can never have enough diapers. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> so enough, uh, enough baby stuff. How's life? What have you been working on the past uh, couple of weeks since we recorded last? So life is good. It's also raining in uh, Florida, um, but it's our rainy season right now. So it's like sunny during the day and then torrential downpour at night. Mm. So uh, right now there's I can hear the birds coming out and chirping. So you might hear some birds in the background in <laughs> this audio. But everything's been good. Um, just been working on whatever courses, um, just getting ready for end of the school year stuff, which you'll find out about in, in due time that uh, all the schools are ending. So there's been craziness going on with kids, with award ceremonies and pizza parties and all these different <laughs> things. Um, but in between that, I've also been working on our new site. My wife and I, uh, Natasha, we are starting a new kind of brand website. It's called The Home-Based Hustle. Nice. And we just plan on blogging and doing a podcast kind of around online business, income, uh, financial, and just different things based kind of around the home environment, whether you're, you know, whether you're single or married or have kids, but just kind of giving like help, tips and tricks and stuff kind of around the home. So uh, this might be good for you to listen to because, yeah. you know, we'll be talking <laughs> a lot about like organization and scheduling stuff that's really important to us, especially with the kids, uh, just making sure that we have time to do all the things that we want to do. We just kind of want to talk about that kind of stuff. So I love it's exciting. That. Yeah, I love that idea. And I think there's a lot of podcasts out there about business and sometimes they bring in that family home element. But I think there's definitely a room for a brand specific to that. And I know when I've been listening to podcasts like recently and I was listening to this guy, Ari Mizell, who's really big on autom automation, optimization, and outsourcing. Mm -hmm. And he has twins. So automatically, I start, like, was connecting with him. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, this guy knows what's up. So uh, I think that is going to be really beneficial. Because also, I think a lot of entrepreneurs... Uh, the people doing the podcast are like single guys in their 20s, early 30s who don't have as many responsibilities. <laughs> so it's easier for them to like crush it with getting a lot of work done. Um, but for to hear that other side of the picture with the family life, that's that's really yeah. good. So where I, this episode is going to be live uh, in a couple months from when we record it. So at that time, your site's going to be live and ready for people to visit. Yep. So where can people find out more about it? 
So I created a uh, free gift for the online course masters community and uh, just something if people want to go get that gift or just sign up for the email list um, because we are still building it. So some things will be live. But part of this website is we wanted to also talk about our journey you know, where we've come from and, and kind of go through the processes of trying different things out and showing what works and doesn't work. So it'll be a lot of fun for people to go check out the website early and kind of see like, as we built it, we'll kind of show you how we built it and mm -hmm. kind of show you the things that we do and why we do them. Um, so you can sign up for the email list and find out when some of that stuff goes live, uh, find out the podcast when it goes live. So if you go over to the homebasedhustle.com, forward slash OCM as for online course masters. So nice. the home base hustle.com forward slash OCM. You can get a free gift there for online course creators too, which will help you out in your course creation process. Nice. And we'll include links to that in the show notes. I don't know how many people actually use the show notes, but they're pretty helpful. <laughs> um, and you can just find them at online course masters.com and go to the blog and find uh, this episode. So we'll link to that. Awesome. Cool. So, uh, Back to online course creation, we're talking about course extras. So what does that really mean? So um, today we're talking about course extras. These are all the other things that go inside your course besides just the basic lectures. So you have your what we would call like the main curriculum, uh, especially if you were like going to school, your main curriculum would be all the content that you get for uh, what you're trying to learn. The extras is everything else kind of above and beyond that. So we're talking about quizzes, um, projects, uh, extra resources. And we're even going to talk a little bit about closed captioning in your course. And if you wanted to uh, have that or if you need that or not inside of your course. So um, the first one we're going to talk about today is quizzes. And, and we're going to talk about uh, should you add a quiz to your course? Uh, what would be the benefits of having a quiz? And when we talk about quiz, we're talking about like maybe a multiple choice or a fill in the blank type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, on Udemy specifically, you can add quizzes through that platform and it's multiple choice. So you can put in the questions and the answers and then do an actual quiz style. Now, I haven't actually set up Teachable or Thinkific, so you can have quizzes in those platforms also, correct? I believe you can, but I also haven't set them up in on Teachable. I've used them on Udemy. Um, and I, I think quizzes are a great idea to just break up the flow of an online course, which is mostly going to be video based. Um, some articles maybe that you add, but mostly it's just going to be people watching video after video. So I think that the purpose of a quiz is to really have the student pause and to check if they're actually learning. I mean, that's what, you know, in mm -hmm. school, that's what our teachers did. They quizzed us to see if we were actually learning, if we were paying attention. And it's really a self-motivated thing on Udemy, especially. They're not necessarily going to pass or fail the course based on if they get if they pass a quiz or not. It's really for them. And I think that sort of expectation needs to be set up early on in the course. If you do have quizzes, uh, letting the students know that, hey, there's going to be quizzes. These are there for you to check your knowledge. Um, and also, it. so I found that like some best practices for quizzes is that it it needs to be very, it actually needs to be beneficial and difficult enough. It can't be too easy or students are going to think it's a waste of time. Um, I think it's good to have them in courses that are maybe related to a skill that has some sort of certification. Uh, if it is something that has to do with like memorizing, like I'm thinking like language based courses. If you're learning French or Spanish, it's a quiz makes perfect sense to quiz someone. I've tried to add quizzes in my classes that are like related to Photoshop or editing in Premiere Pro, and it doesn't work as well in those classes uh, just because it's it's not a skill where you're memorizing like facts or or it's just like a hands on skill. So I feel like for hands on skills, quizzes mm. aren't that good. Um, in terms of the length, I don't think it should be that long uh, because you don't want it to feel like too much of a burden. Between like five and ten questions is probably good. I mean, even like four to six questions might be an ideal mm -hmm. length for a Udemy course. Um, just to just again to break up that flow to get the students to pause. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any other sort of best practices. I know on Udemy you can do it's multiple choice. You could do like a true false. 
uh, question by using the multiple choice, like one option's true, one option's false. Uh, the thing with like quizzes is to try to make it automated as possible if you're not using Udemy, whereas you don't want to have to be grading these these courses. And there's tools um, on most of these platforms that have quizzes that it's going to be automated. It's going to give the students the results and you don't have to really do anything Um the one thing that is also beneficial on Udemy is that you can refer people to a specific lecture when they answer like a question. So if you ask a question about like for me, one in my photography courses, maybe a good question would be uh, something related to say, what what is the aperture of a, a camera lens? And they have a few options. And if they get it right or if they get it wrong, you can say, uh, sorry, that's incorrect rewatch lecture number seven or whatever it is and refer to the point in the course where they can go back and relearn that skill. Uh, I find that some students like them. Some people, some students don't need them at all. Um, but I think people are used to, used to taking quizzes in courses. So it, it is kind of a natural thing to add in, in a Mm -hmm. class. And I would also say that, you know, the quiz length might be determined on how many you have in the course and where you place them. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you don't want them to be too long. I wouldn't stick like a 25 question quiz after like the first lecture because you're really going to lose people. But if you're maybe you want to do five or six quizzes throughout your course and you have two or three questions each I think that would be good, two to four or six, like you said. Um, Or if it's at the end, maybe you could do just like a big quiz at the end of the course and just say, you know, here's 20 questions going out through the whole whole course. I think that's also beneficial. And um, I do believe that, like you said, it's great for like certifications, uh, programming, like you said, anything where you're having to memorize like uh, functions or formulas or anything Mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, Because I do believe that there could be some quizzes where, you know, it's not just really going to make any sense to have a quiz on that information. I was thinking like maybe a DIY or baking or cooking where you could quiz it, but you know, is it really worth it for that particular course? Yeah. Yeah. And I like that idea of having maybe one quiz at the end of the course. The thing about including a quiz on Udemy um, is that when people are looking at the landing page of a course, it shows up that this course has quizzes. And so that might be a turn on for some people to want to buy the course just because it shows that it has, you know, this extra value to it. The The thing that I'll just reiterate is to make sure that the questions have a very clear answer that it's not like, oh, maybe it's choice A or choice C because I've had question quizzes like that. And then I have to spend a lot of time when yeah. some students reply or message me and are like, hey, in the quiz, this question was really confusing. Like, I thought it was yeah. this. And so you really want it to be clear. I know those questions are good. Uh, they put a lot of those like kind of wishy-washy questions. I'm sure you remember that from grammar school or high school, but for an online course, you don't want to have to be following up with the students and having to explain yourself or the quiz. So definitely make it um, easy. So yeah, I think either having one longer quiz at the end of the course or split up. It depends on how long your sections are. Some people might want to have it in every section of the course, but if you're set your course sections are only like two or three videos long you probably don't want to put a quiz at the end of every section i would say maybe every hour or two worth of video content that's how long you how far you'd want to have quizzes separated nice that that makes that makes a good sense and you don't want to do like one quiz at the end of a like 20 hour long course either because people will never remember this stuff at the beginning yeah yeah so so quizzes are, are great. They're, they're a nice way to help reinforce information um, to kind of prompt the student. And like you said, it kind of breaks up the monotony. I like having them throughout the course. That way you can watch a couple videos and then maybe a quiz pops up and it just kind of you know makes you think there for a minute before diving into more videos. Some other things that we can do is have projects. Now, I, I believe that when you're doing any of these course extras, you can mix these up throughout the whole course as much as you want because I feel like it does kind of 
break up the monotony of watching videos over and over and over again. So um, what is a project and why why do you feel that they would be important to have in a course? I love projects and I love them more than quizzes because I think it really shows to the student that they are learning something. It is more, it's easier to come up with a project when it is sort of a creative hands-on skill but even if it's a technical skill like building websites or doing programming, you can have projects where your student is building an application or or even, I mean, I have projects in all of my classes. So from taking photos to a course where we taught about how to have better presence on camera, where we had people submitting videos with them practicing being on camera for the first time. And so I definitely think including some sort of project in your course is great. Students tend to love them. Uh, mm -hmm. You can host your project in a so different ways. You can have a separate sort of video lecture where you're prompting people to do something. Uh, you can have a text-based lecture where you're prompting someone to do something. On Udemy, you can actually create an assignment-based lecture, which is a semi-newer feature. It's been around for a little while. I feel like not all that many people use it um, to the best of its abilities, but it actually has a cool feature where you, it's a lecture, but it has the step-by-step -step process for here are the instructions, here are, here's where you submit your project, here is the instructor sample, so you can refer to it, and then here is, it prompts students to actually leave feedback for other students. So assignments are great. I think it's something that you should definitely include in all of your classes. Um, and know that it's going to be a little bit of extra work though. And students do expect to get feedback, especially on Udemy, because built into that, the each assignment, it has a spot where instructors, it asks instructors, how could this student have made this better? Mm -hmm. Provide feedback to the student. And so I think the students, when they submit their assignments, they see that little box that says, mm -hmm. here's where this instructor is going to leave feedback. And so they start to expect that feedback. So make sure that you are either dedicated to that and you spend enough time every week, just like when you're answering questions or responding to reviews in your class, make sure you're responding to all of the assignments um, or have the expectation and set it up for the students saying that, we either don't get to all of our assignments, it's meant for you, so we don't provide feedback on all of the assignments. If you have specific questions or if you want specific feedback, please reach out to us because some students don't really care about the feedback. They just want to do it. Others mm -hmm. totally expect it. Or you can set up some sort of expectation like once a month we go through all of our assignments and we'll get back to you, uh, but please be patient with us. And that's something that I've had to learn over time because students submit that work and they expect feedback the next day. And that's right. impossible. It's it's like so too much work when, when you're trying to grow like a full online business uh, to be doing that. That's also why I've hired assistants to help me respond to assignments in a, in a timely manner. Uh, but yeah, projects are great. So I think we can kind of dive a little bit deeper. But have you added um, assignments to your, your classes that you've done on your own? Yeah, I mean, I, I love projects and uh, Skillshare is actually a really good platform mm -hmm. uh, for project based material because they usually tend to go for shorter courses that are solely project based for the most part. Yeah. Um, I feel like they do it really well because you can go in, you can see other students projects, you can comment on them and you actually get notifications whenever someone does a project. So you can go in there and check that out. Um, so with Skillshare, usually you create like a certain, not all courses, some courses are longer, but a lot of courses on Skillshare, is you, you create um, one single topic and maybe one project. Um, but on Udemy, you can have like longer courses, more in-depth courses. And like you said, maybe you're building a website. The project is building that website, but I feel like you could also have smaller projects throughout the course that have you do smaller smaller projects that lead up to building the main project. So uh, if you're building a website, 
maybe your first project is to make your about page or home page or something. And then mm -hmm. your second project is uh, make your contact page. So you can even have smaller projects throughout the whole course. Um, and we were just maybe going to give a couple quick examples before we move on. Um, like we talked about some of these examples before in photography, you could have the student go out and take photos of some landscape photography and submit those to the course. And then everyone can come in and talk about those photographs and how they looked. Um, we talk about the, uh, the bread baking, uh, we can, you know, that might be the actual project of the whole course. How can you recreate the San Francisco style sourdough bread? Um, if that's the course, that could be the main project. But again, maybe you could have some smaller projects throughout that course. And then uh, we talked about digital marketing before. So maybe um, one of the projects is something like set up a Facebook group and then, you know, maybe take a screenshot and show us or send yeah. a link of, of that group so that we can check it out. And the thing about projects is you're getting the student to take action. So where the quiz is nice, it kind of prompts a student and it makes them think about what they've learned. The project actually gets them to go and do something. And I feel like even having smaller projects early on is important because you want that student taking action and not just sitting there watching a bunch of videos and not really doing anything. Yeah, totally. And I think that's key to break it into smaller projects. Um, it, you don't want to be overwhelming for a student and you want it to be actually easy, especially at the beginning for someone to take action. And like you said, putting it earlier in the course is a great idea. I actually think putting it within the first like 10, 20 minutes of a course, having some sort of little assignment or project is a good idea. Just because when, especially on Udemy, where reviews are so important and students are leaving reviews after the first 15 minutes of content, if they're doing an assignment already and they're seeing that they're already learning something within that first half hour of the course or so, they're going to be much more likely to leave a better review. Uh, it's kind of a tricky balance, though, because you have to actually be teaching something in that first bit of the class. Um, and you don't want to just be like making people do something that they don't really understand. Uh, but it can be super simple. Like, for example, we I have a digital marketing class with my buddy Diego Davila, and he, we have a number of assignments. Some range from setting up a Facebook group to just simply finding three Facebook pages or Facebook groups that inspire you, and just like prompting people to actually take a little bit of action. And people see, you know, it's like getting people to like just like write it down or to to really comprehend it. People are on Facebook all the time seeing pages or groups they like, but when you prompt them to do something like find three Facebook groups that you like mm -hmm. and write them down, it makes them really think about what they like about that group or page. That's just an example, an example but making it easy to do is really important. And again, I think seeing that a course has assignments or activities in it it's more incentivizing for a student to purchase that course if it's if they're comparing two courses that are similar. One has activities, one doesn't. Right. Yeah, I, I like that example you gave. I hadn't thought about that because when you were talking, I was thinking about guitar playing, uh, which is something I do. And I'm like, if you're creating a course on guitar playing, it's going to be hard for them to submit a project right away because you haven't taught them really how to play yet. So, But maybe something like, go find your favorite lead guitar solo and post that to, you know, even just a one sentence, you know, yeah. post that to, to the course and tell us what, what solo would you like to learn? And then that's kind of cool because it gets them to think about it. And then by the end of the course, maybe they could learn how to play that uh, solo and at the end have another project, you know, go back and try to play it and submit that or something. Yeah. So we've, talked about quizzes. Uh, they're great for prompting and anything that's certification based or needs to be memorized. We talked about projects which are great for getting the student to do something, something actionable. Let's talk about resources. Uh, resources is any kind of extra that you could have to the course that might help the student learn um, or continue their growth or maybe like a tool. So what are some examples of resources that you've used in the past or any that you can think of? Yeah, this is anything from something that I've created, like a PDF that has sort of the key points of a, a lesson or a section. It could be um, proc practice files that students are working with to in throughout the course. So in a lot of my Adobe 
Creative Suite classes. I'll give them photos to edit or videos to edit or things like that. And so they're actually be able to download that and use it. Uh, it could be just references to helpful materials. And that's the cool thing is that you don't have to create it all and students appreciate it. I think I used to be like, well, and it's better to have it yourself or to refer to something on your own website because you kind of control that. But I used to think like, I was very against like referring people to other resources. But I always think back to uh, uh, Miracle on 31st Street and how uh, Santa Claus refers people at Macy's to all the other department stores and who because Macy's didn't have the toy that the kid wanted. So he referred them to all the other department stores. And those customers were super happy. Of course, this is a fictional tale. And they ended up loving Macy's even much more and wanting to be a, a customer there. Uh, but I feel like the same thing. Like if I, As long as I'm helping the student, they're going to appreciate me referring them to another website that has helpful articles or guides or things or whatever um, because they don't want to spend the time having to search that for themselves. And so our latest photography masterclass, the new version is a great example of uh, having a lot of different supplemental resources that we added. Uh, we created sort of visual, what we called visual guides where we took like a key concept and we just visualize, visualized it um, <laughs> with like graphics and, and it's just a PDF that people can download. We wrote articles that we are in the course, but we also created a PDF version of it. Again, mm -hmm. just it's the same content. It's just downloadable for them to take. And then we have at the end of every section, we have a list of related articles. Some come from my website, some are other websites and uh, articles or even YouTube videos that are that are helpful. So there's all sorts of stuff. And then the last thing kind of related is just a question I often get is, do we should we make our videos downloadable for students to be able to download? Uh, there's the risk of piracy and someone taking that video and trying to sell it or upload it on YouTube or whatever. And that's always going to be a risk. But I think the benefit of allowing students to download our lessons so that they could watch it when they don't have internet is very beneficial. There's lots of people who have come up to me or messaged me and said, you know, I let my internet's not that fast and I'll let the course download overnight so that I can watch it tomorrow or I'm going on a flight and I want to download all your videos and watch it on the flight. And so I think the benefit to students by allowing them to download the course is greater than the risk of piracy because if someone's going to pirate your course, they're going to figure out how to mm -hmm. download it or screencast your course or do whatever it is. And I don't really pay attention too much to piracy. Um, I, I, I'm of the belief that I don't think there's no way to really control it completely. And I don't think it hurts me monetarily that much because the people who are going to be downloading a pirated course are never going to buy my course anyways. It's not like they're going to be on Udemy and they're going to be like on the fence like, okay, should I buy this or... Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the pirate store and and see if Phil's courses are on there. Because if they're thinking about that, they're just automatically going to go to the pirate store. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's not what you call it, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> the pirate store. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I've had my stuff pirated. Um, you can probably go find any one of my courses online. Yeah. But like you said, the people who appreciate you, who are, you know, trust you and like you and, and you know, have the money to, they're gonna they're gonna buy for you just because. Like even if they could go find it, they're gonna they're gonna buy it because they like you as a person or they like your brand. Mm -hmm. Um I found that to be true that just, you know, I, I don't worry about the people who are gonna who are gonna take it for free because I probably would have never got anything from those people anyways. So I never even pay attention to that. Um, I know there's a lot of rules of thought on should you go and, and send out, you know, notices and have all the videos taken down and all this stuff. And like I've done that before, like I spent the time to go into YouTube and send out notices, but I feel like I waste more time trying to fight it yeah. than I could be creating content or helping the students who really want to be helped. So yeah. Um, that that kind of stuff, you know, you just yeah, it, it make your stuff downloadable, easy for students who buy it and who want to consume the content. 
to be able to get that. Uh, going back real quick to the resources also, I wanted to mention that um, any of the resources that you create, and you gave some great examples, especially about using other articles that might not even be yours, um, but they don't have to be overly complicated. Mm -hmm. So if you want to create a PDF, just keep in mind that it doesn't have to be a full color, 200 page, beautifully you know, presented PDF. It could be a something as simple as a one page, all text document that just says, here are my top 10 or my top five things that uh, are good resources for you. And like you said, people are going to appreciate that. Um, I know like in my Photoshop or graphic design, I'll use uh, websites. I'll just say, hey, mm -hmm. check out this URL. One example is uh, Adobe's color program, color.adobe.com. I'll use that and just say, hey, go use this as a tool to help you create colors for your websites or graphics or what have you. So it doesn't have to be overly complicated. It could be something very similar, uh, simple. Yeah. Um, so we talked about resources um, and you talked about having downloadable videos. Something that kind of goes along with that is closed captioning. So mm -hmm. uh, closed captions are the text that you see at the bottom of a video. So anyone who uh, has uh, trouble hearing or um, can't see very well, you can have the words down there uh, in big, bold letters uh, across the screen talking about whatever you're presenting. So are closed captions important? Like why, why should you even have closed captions? Um, it does take a long time to create those if it's not being done automatically. So at what point should you include co closed captions or should you just do it all the time? I mean, the good thing about Udemy is that they have an auto captions process. It's not the best. It's similar to YouTube where all videos are auto captioned nowadays. Uh, and you'll notice that it makes mistakes. But surprisingly, it's it's pretty amazing how how well it does. Um, and it's, I think, only going to get better over time. Um, so that's the first thing to know is that if you're doing it on Udemy, they automatically caption your videos. I do think it's important. It's a decent audience that does want the closed captions, not only people who are hard of hearing, but also people who are coming from another language where English isn't their first language um, or whatever language you're, you're speaking and you're trying to reach a worldwide audience. A lot of people from other countries appreciate that some of my courses have English captions or even if taking it a step further, translated captions. I know that Udemy is currently doing some tests to auto translate their auto captions, That's cool. uh, which is awesome. And I think, you know, in a few years, if not even sooner, it's just going to be an option that's going to be on all courses that it's auto caption and then you could pick any language. And so right now, it, I actually am struggling with this kind of trying to figure out, do I want to spend the time and money to caption and translate my courses to other languages? Or do I just wait and, you know, see if Udemy does it automatically in the future? Uh, I think if, if you're doing it on your own website, if you're doing Teachable or Thinkific, I still think it's a great idea. Uh, mm -hmm. There's cheap or there's free options there's free ways to like do it where you can upload your videos to youtube which automatically transcribes or captions your videos then you could download that caption file from youtube and then edit it to make sure there's no mistakes and use that file to upload to teachable or even to udemy um, so that's kind of a really roundabout time time consuming process uh, there's ways to pay for it that are relatively inexpensive, like rev.com, rev.com. They charge a dollar a minute of content for captions. I, I think it's a dollar a minute um, still. And for me, that's been worth it for, um, for some of my content. But when you end up getting to a class that's 10, 15 hours long, that, that can add up. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can also find people, freelancers, on places like Upwork.com or Freelancer.com to do it. And I have one person uh, who I don't want to give out their name because I don't want everyone <laughs> bogging her down with work. But she she charges about 50 cents a minute. So it's it's better nice. than Rev. It takes a little bit longer than Rev. The quality is probably it's close to what Rev does, which they say it's 99% accurate. Uh, but you might be able to find someone on rev dot or on a place like upwork dot com to do it for cheaper. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I think it's great. Um, 
out of all of these extras, I think it's probably the the last thing you want to think about. It's something you can think about once your course is actually launched. Um, and it, and the Udemy caption files are pretty good. And Udemy actually has a an easy editor that you can use to edit their caption files right right on the platform now. So that's cool too. Now we'll attack on another thing about YouTube. Um, one thing that you can do on Udemy, and of course you could do this if you were self-hosting, is you can take some of your lectures, some of your videos, and put them on YouTube for free. So for instance, I can have a Udemy course and I can take a little bit of that content and put it on YouTube. Now you can't put the whole thing because it's against their policies. But if you take some of your uh, videos that you want to preview and maybe have some ki- kind of funnel from YouTube to your video courses, you can stick maybe a couple lectures on YouTube. Now, it will close caption those videos on YouTube. Of course, you want to go in them and edit them and make sure they're good. But what I've heard, and I, I don't know if this is 100% true, but I did hear that Udemy's search engine will actually look at closed captions. Hmm. So there's a possibility that if you have your videos on Udemy, or on YouTube with closed captions, you could actually be searched for a keyword inside of the closed captions of what you said. And if you do that and then they land on your video and then you have a link out to your course, that would be a way to kind of generate some type of traffic. So I don't know if Udemy would ever get to that point where you can actually search through the closed mm-hmm. captions for keywords, but I did hear that that is, that is something on YouTube. Again, yeah. I don't know if it's 100% true. It's just something I heard. So I think uh, I've heard you know, that too. Yeah, it's some some to take into consideration, and I usually stick a couple videos on YouTube just to try to capture maybe a couple people uh, to my course on Udemy if possible. Yeah. Um. So another resource, and this is one that you do a lot. I've I've noticed that you uh, seem to like these. I actually w- um was involved in someone else's brand who did this a lot, and I always enjoyed them. It's a, a contest or a giveaway. So let's talk about those. Um, what kind of contests have you held in the past, and why do you like doing them so much? Yeah, contests and giveaways are a great way just to build student morale, to get them excited to be a part of this course, and also to set yourself apart from the other course. All of these other things are kind of extras that you can build into the content of the course. Uh, The next couple things I'm talking about are just things that you kind of do outside and maybe it's more of launching or promoting your course. But for example, in our photography classes, we'll do contests where once a year it's post your favorite photo from the year and we'll will just judge them and I usually get a panel and I think you were a judge on one of my contests mm-hmm. actually uh, yeah. I'll get a panel of five to ten judges a lot of fun. and uh, yeah and it's amazing how awesome the student photos are and I think last year we had over it was like 800 people submit photos which was crazy um, and so that's like a once a year big contest that I have and last year I we had a pretty good prize it was I think it was a hundred dollars on Amazon so that was pretty good um, And this year I'm doing even smaller, like not just once a year, but we're doing, for example, in our new photography class, a specific portrait photography competition. So I think these contests or like a giveaway just incentivizes people to take action, to be a part of the class. And at the end of the day, it's partly just to get better reviews because if you're in a class and there's a contest and you know, you're participating and it's not just watching videos, but they have all these extras, I think it just creates this better atmosphere for the student. Um, and I don't have any proof that you get more be- there, you get more and better reviews when you do contests and giveaways, but I have a feeling that students enjoy them, or I know students enjoy them because they tell me. Um, and it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be a giving away $100. It could be giving away a free course. It could be giving away a free ebook that you already have or a free course that you already have. Um, or it could be something smaller like, $25 Amazon gift card. I found that Amazon gift cards are great because you can just send them to people's emails. And I feel like people from a lot of places in the world can use them. Um, so, so yeah. And the way that you hold these uh, can be any number of things. It could be a, an assignment on Udemy where you ask people to submit something in the assignment. It could just be a new video lecture. And you can announce these things through the educational messages on Udemy, through your email list. Uh, and and yeah, you, there's any number of ways to kind of run them. But I definitely have found them to be beneficial in, in my classes. 
Yeah, I, I remember um, I really got close to a brand. So way back when, it's funny now because I learned about this website because I was learning Blender, uh, which is a 3D animation modeling uh, software. And this was before I really got into online business. And, and looking back now, I can see some of the things that he was doing to help build his brand. And one of those things was a monthly contest. So he would have people create a 3d render of uh whatever the topic was for the month and each month it was usually had had some theme so mm -hmm. uh during december it would be like a christmas theme during october it would be a halloween theme and he would have people create these renders and then submit them to his website and he got hundreds and hundreds and i've submitted a couple but i used to love just going and looking at them because they were so amazing and what i realize now is that that was really building his brand because mm -hmm. it kept me coming back each month each month i was like oh i wonder what the contest is going to be this month. Let me go check it out. So that is a great way to, to help build up your brand and your reputation and, and keep people involved, uh, sort of like doing a project. Um, and then as far as the giveaways go, I've seen people do giveaways that help introduce a brand. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, we have, at, we talked about at the beginning of the show, the home base hustle. My wife and I are going to do a podcast, um, maybe to get people into our brand, we might maybe do a giveaway where we can we can give away something relating to our brand. Or yeah. you know, if I was doing a podcast course, maybe I could uh, give away a microphone. Or if I'm doing a online course, uh, maybe I could do like you know, I'm going to give you a camera or uh, you know something of that nature. And then what you have is people entering this contest or this giveaway. And if you tie it into like an email opt-in, um, they have to give you your email and then they're enter it entered into a drawing for whatever giveaway you have you're collecting emails you're building your list uh, and then you're getting people into your brand also yeah and that's a great idea one company that has done a really good job at that is convert kit they do a get they used to do i haven't seen it lately but they used to do giveaways of t-shirts and so it had their like brand logo and their slogans on them and every month or so they'd give away 50 50 uh, t-shirts and this is more this could be with an online course or just like with your brand or your social media uh but they would get people you know it was like the first 50 people who like this post get a t-shirt and so now they have all these entrepreneurs who are using convert kit building their own audiences building content me included pat flynn included and mm -hmm. all these people that i know and follow they're all wearing convert kit shirts in their videos and on on social media and so it just builds this brand identity and that's something that I've always wanted to do with online course masters or with my video school online brand. I think it really helps when you are catering to other people who are creating content because then your your brand and your logos are showing up uh, online more. Uh, but yeah, that's definitely a, just giveaways are great and I'll say that one thing that I did it's hard to track to track like how much this helped, but when we launched our new photography class, uh, and I keep mentioning this class just because I feel like it was it was our strongest launch. It's been our best class to date, and I think we did a lot of things right. But one thing we did was a giveaway when we launched the course, and so what mm -hmm. we said, and we talked to Udemy and got this approved. So um, I would check double check for yourself, but they approved it. They said that we can do a giveaway during the launch. So we said in our promotional materials, materials, we said, if you join the class in the next 48 hours, you get automatically entered into a drawing for a new camera. And we were giving away some other stuff like a tripod and a few other things. And so I don't know how many people ended up buying just because of that. But it definitely incentivized people to buy right then and there rather than than waiting. Uh, so that was something that was cool that we did for the launch launch of this course. And I haven't really seen many other Udemy instructors doing that. Uh, so that could be another thing to, to try out. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. And like you said, just check with uh, the platform, whatever platform you're yeah. using, just to make sure that uh, the rules are okay and you're not you're not breaking any rules, especially on Udemy because you got to be real careful. Sometimes they'll even change the rules. It'll be one thing one yeah. month and then it'll get changed to something different. You got to make sure you keep up with that. Um, so the last thing that we have in here is building a community in your course. Now, this is, this is sort of an extra, but it's also um, something to help bring people together, uh, 
such as like a Facebook group or mm-hmm. some place where you can have a community building around your your brand or who you are as an instructor or your course. Um, so how have you leveraged communities in the past in your courses? I think, I mean, that's the point is just to build sort of a community of students where they're not feeling like they're in a silo learning by themselves. But if they can feel like they're learning next to other students, I think it makes the course better. The best example, again, is with our photography course. And with the original version, I didn't have a Facebook group. Uh, It was something that students had asked about and they thought, oh, it'd be cool to create a Facebook group for the class so they they could post more photos and get more feedback. Mm -hmm. So we decided to do that with this new course. And over about a month, we have over a thousand members in that that group and people are posting photos left and right. And it's amazing to see how many people are engaged. And aside from having places in the class where they can do activities and get feedback, having this group is a more casual way for people to interact and to post their photos for feedback and things like that, which I think the students really love. Another co-instructor of mine, um, also a uh, Jeremy, we <laughs> we uh, created a an affinity designer course and he created uh, a group for affinity designer. And that group is awesome because it's again on Facebook and it's I think the cool thing about these groups is that you and I think you can leave them open to the public for people who aren't necessarily in the course. There's I guess there's two uh, two kind of rules. I guess you could keep it closed just for students in the group. That's great because it kind of keeps it exclusive or you can open it up to everyone and you get people who aren't in the course interested in the course because they're now in this group. And like for in our photography course, for example, we're opening it up to the public. Anyone can join. But we're talking about things like contests and the activities and things like that where you have to be a member of the course. So I think eventually Mm -hmm. we're going to get people actually joining the group and then buying the course through that sort of funnel. Uh, We're doing live streams in there and things. Again, just all this stuff to add to the course and to make it better, make it more engaging for the student. Uh, And yeah, just to try to help benefit them and ultimately help them to learn too. I think at the end of this podcast, hopefully you've you've heard a lot of good examples and concrete things that you can do with your courses. You don't have to do all of these um, and it's a lot of work to do for all of your courses, but for your flagship courses, for your, your big courses, definitely do a lot of these. And, uh, it could even be a group for your entire brand. It doesn't have to be a course specific group or community. Um, it could be a community on Facebook for all of your courses. That is just another resource where they can meet other people, get your support, Um, and, and yeah, I've found that Facebook groups are good because it's just the most popular platform and Mm -hmm. it's easy for people to use. Uh, some people I have gotten students who say, Oh, I'm not on Facebook. Like, why can't we do this somewhere else? But at the end of the day, Facebook is just the most popular and it's, it's super easy to use. So I recommend it. The good thing about the communities is it keeps the conversation going. Yeah. So if you have a course, you know, once the person has taken your course and learned what they want to learn, they're pretty much done with the course. I mean, how often have you gone back and rewatched another course where you learn how to do that thing already? It doesn't happen too often. But when you build a community, then you're you're keeping the conversation going. You're you're staying fresh in the eyes of the student, and they get to see you and your brand over and over again, mm-hmm. and it helps build that repertoire as you go on. Yeah. So to recap for the course extras, we we did quizzes, um, which helps prompt you know students or make them think about what they're learning projects, which is something actionable that they can go do and submit resources, which is any type of extra tool or PDF or anything extra that will help them learn or guide them along their journey. Uh, Adding closed captions for anyone who might be hearing impaired or from another country to help them understand your course uh, content better. Contests and giveaways might help build your brand or just provide something fun for your students to do. And then finally, building a community around your course or your brand to help tie it all together. Is there anything else in the course extras that we missed that a student could add? I mean, I think that covers a lot of them. And I would just go look at the best selling courses in your niche and the ones that you're trying to compete with and see what they do. Uh, A lot of these things I've taken from and learned from other people on Udemy or people 
off of Udemy who are selling uh, more premium products. And and that's something you might be thinking again. It's like, man, this is a lot of work to do for a class that sells for $10 on Udemy. And yes, it's true. It's like, if you join my photo- photography course, you're getting 20 hours of content plus all these cool things, plus a community on Facebook, live streams, all this stuff. And it's only $10. It's like, how could anyone not read this course five stars? <laughs> and that's what I want is I want people to feel like this is such a crazy good deal that there's no reason for them to not give it a good review and to refer friends to it. Uh, and I think if you can do that, you're going to be successful. So, uh, so yeah, I think we covered them. Uh, this is awesome. Anyways, um, as always, head over to Facebook, go to the Online Course Masters group, or just go to onlinecoursemasters.com, click that community tab. We've got over 2,000 people, 50 or so people joining every week to our community, asking questions, helping each other out. And uh, you can, again, like Jeremy said, keep the conversation going by heading over there. And also, I'll just mention one more time, Jeremy's website, thehomebasedhustle.com slash OCM. Go check it out. Sign up for his email list and get your freebie. Uh, And uh, yeah, support Jeremy because he's been an awesome co-host this season. So Jeremy, we'll talk to you later and we'll see you next week uh, when we talk about some of the final things when we put together our courses, such as creating your course graphics like images, videos, your promo videos, and the social media graphics uh, to help promote your course as well. Cool. Talk to you later.